Hello everyone, we've got some more classic late 90s computer econo to check out. HP bubble systems. That's what I call this round bulbous case style that was so popular at the time. And we can even see the transition from beige to translucent. Alright, let's tear into these. Starting with the Pavilion 8240, this case is in reasonably good condition. It just has a few scuffs here and there, no big deal. But some of the design elements are kind of puzzling. For example, this drive bay cover is kind of strange. I'm curious how many five and a quarter inch drives you can actually fit in this. This taper has to limit the usefulness somehow. I can't wait to see what's behind that and find out what they're doing. And down below we have some pretty nicely preserved badges. Those have definitely survived pretty well. We're designed for Windows 95. And we have an Intel Pentium 1 with MMX technology. So much future. I see we just narrowly averted disaster with this scrape. It didn't hurt the Pavilion logo. Very glad about that. And here's a look around the back. I'm really surprised to see USB on this thing. I don't see very many Windows 95 computers with USB. And we have all the usual ports as well. Got our PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. Got our serial and parallel ports. Onboard video. And some kind of sound card. That definitely looks OEM. And of course a dial-up modem. Okay, now it's time to get this thing open. But first I have to figure out how. It doesn't look like the most obvious thing in the world at first glance. I see somebody's already unscrewed this panel, but that doesn't look like it gets us very far. Usually with these pavilions, this top piece has to slide back, so I'll have to figure out how to get that done. I see somebody's been hack jobbing on this thing with a screwdriver. Clearly that's not the way. I see we have two screws here. Hopefully that dispatches this entire panel. Let's find out. Aha! Maybe. What are we catching on? Okay, it was just a clip. Okay, now it looks like that liberates this side panel here. So let's try to slide that off. Aha! Okay, that was easier than I thought. I might as well pull that back panel too. Hey, we have a build date here. January 22nd, 1998. So this is a later Windows 95 machine. Okay, unfortunately we are missing the hard drive. But everything else does seem to be there. Let's just go ahead and clear these cables out. Now hopefully I can pull this fan duct without breaking it. We got a little release tab up here. Let's pull on that and then pull up. There we go. Oh, it comes with the fan. Let's go ahead and get that disconnected. And they have an interesting approach to cable management there. I like the way that CD audio cable runs down the back of the system here. And I'm not quite sure what this cable is. I have a suspicion we have some proprietary power connectors going on. That is never a good thing. Well, let's get these cables out of here. Now these peripheral cards are held in with a single piece of sheet metal here. And just two screws gets rid of that. Now let's check out that sound card. And that is an Insonic ES1370. It's cool to see an Insonic card that predates the creative acquisition. Pretty clean little card. And this system is pretty clean in general, I'm pleased to see. Okay, I'm kind of puzzled by this connector here. I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to do, but it definitely matches that mystery connector from the power supply. Now tell me, why would the power supply need to connect directly to the sound card? That is awfully strange. Now let's check out that dial-up modem. And we have a Lucent modem. Looks like it's from 1997. Also remarkably clean. And the shape of this motherboard looks awfully strange in this giant case. That is just too funny. And I don't see a brand on this motherboard, but that model number is written in a font that is most definitely used by ASUS. And the rest of the board just looks really asus -y in general. And looks like this motherboard is in control of the power supply fan, as some systems of this era often are. Now let's disconnect that power supply. Now let's go ahead and get that RAM out of the way, since it blocks the CPU heatsink clip. No immediately useful info on that side. And none on this side either. RAM manufacturers just love to keep you guessing. Let's check out the next one. And this one's also unmarked. And just remember, at this time period, search engines were not nearly what they are now, so there was no way to Google these part numbers, because there was no Google, so RAM sticks were even more of a guessing game. Okay, now we can get at the CPU. And as promised, 
That's an Intel Pentium 1 with MMX technology, and not a lick of thermal compound anywhere. See, even HP was guilty of that. Let's go ahead and pull that out of there. And all the pins look good. This is an SL27S chip that should put its clock speed at 233 MHz. Very nice. And the onboard video is provided by an ATI264VT2, also known as a Mach 64. And we have an Intel 430TX chipset, FW82439TX. Okay, now let's see what's going on with those drive bays. I see a three and a half inch adapter down there, so I'm pretty sure they didn't intend for you to put a five and a quarter inch drive in that bay. Let's get this floppy drive out of here. Now let's pull the CD drive. It's awfully tight in there. And that CD-ROM drive is made by LG. Gold Star is actually the G in LG with the L standing for lucky, so perhaps this drive is not so lucky. We shall see. Manufactured January 1998. And the floppy drive is made by Mitsumi, model D359T7. That's a pretty common floppy drive model, which is a good thing because it means if it's hooped, we can just transfer this custom door and button onto another one. And I actually have a bunch of these. And that thing is remarkably clean. This machine must have been in a very clean environment or have very low hours. Not seeing a lot of dust built up anywhere. However, I've been burned before, so we're still gonna clean this thing up. Yeah, pretty clean. Now we'll clean up the lead screw with IPA. And give it some fresh grease. Okay, let's work this fan. The bearing seems fine. I just need to get rid of that dust. And this is interesting. There's some brains in here. I guess that's how HP is accomplishing fan speed control. I wonder how many pennies they save by doing that. Well, let's make sure it still sounds fine while it's on. And yep, perfectly fine. There we go, good as new. Okay, I wanna get this power supply out of here. There's just one small problem. In HP's infinite wisdom, they threaded that screw towards the bottom rather than towards the top, which means I need to figure out how to get that plastic piece off. I see what appears to be a release tab up here, so let's try that out. No, that's not doing it. So we're binding up on something. Looks like it's catching on the face plastic. Let's see if I can give it a little nudge in the right direction. Aha, there we go. Now I can get that stupid screw. There we go. Okay, at first glance, this power supply seems perfectly fine, judging by its weight compared to its output rating. In general, a heavier power supply tends to be a higher quality power supply, just in my experience. But with this thing being as old as it is, I'm still gonna open it up and check it out inside. But before I do that, let me just say that power supplies can be very dangerous. Even if they've been unplugged for a while, they can still zap you. So if you're not sure what you're doing, you should definitely avoid taking them apart. Either that or just be extremely careful. Don't touch anything on the circuit board, including the heat sinks. All right, this thing looks almost brand new inside. I don't see any problems whatsoever. And there is only the very slightest dust buildup Okay then, let's power this thing up. All right, will it explode? That is the question. The 12 volt rail on this power supply is only rated for 50 watts, so I'm gonna skip the light bulb. The sacrificial hard drives will have to do. Let's see. Okay, doing just fine. But that hard drive's getting a little noisy in its old age. Okay, we're at five minutes. That power supply is perfectly fine. And I just noticed that the mains voltage selector switch has a mechanical linkage. <laughs> that is weird. I can't imagine that could possibly be cheaper than mounting a switch here like every other power supply. How very odd. And I'm not surprised that battery is dead, but I am surprised it's not more dead. That thing's still hanging on with over one volt. That's not enough though. Man, that CPU is cool. Let's make sure it stays that way. All right, let's test this thing. Let's get a DOS boot disk in there. And fire it up. And I have no activity on the screen and no beep codes. This thing's not happy. Okay, let's figure out why. Let's try deoxing those RAM slots first. Let's see what we get now. All right, now we're posting and we're booting. And that CD-ROM's detected. 
We're looking good so far. It was making some clunky sounds though. Let's see if it works. Well, kind of lazy, but it did open. Well, it doesn't sound like it's having a good time. Let's see. But it does work. It doesn't sound great in there. And although I seriously doubt it, let's see if this thing reads a CDR. Okay, that sounded terrible. I wonder what in there would even cause that sound. Oh, it said no. <laughs> Come on. Just accept it. Okay, there we go. That thing sounds like it just absolutely hates life. It did spin up though. And it reads. Okay, that's kind of surprising. CD drives from the 90s are usually really fussy about reading CDRs. Okay, let's get that boot disc out of there and see if this thing supports a tappy boot. Control Alt Delete. Okay, so it sounds like it did at least try to boot, but those are some of the worst sounds I've ever heard out of a CD drive. And it definitely smells like something's getting hot in there. Let's pop that drive out of there and see what's going on with it. Okay, now, let's find the source of all those angry sounds. Okay, opening up for no reason. Let's get a disc in there. That's not easy to get to. There we go. Okay, now it's sounding better. <laughs> okay, what's up with that? Let's see if I can find some way to anger it. Okay, that thing does not want to open. And that could mean this switch is going bad. Okay, that switch is perfectly fine. And this is funny. If I press the button, nothing happens until I give it just a little tap. And then it opens just fine. But that only happens if I push the button first. So that is very strange. It's definitely detecting the button push, but why is it not spinning down the disc? So I think what I'll do next is just take it completely apart, clean and lubricate everything, and see if we get any better behavior. And just in case you're also working on this type of drive, I wanna show the method for releasing the disc tray, because it's not obvious at all. There's a release tab on each side of the drive here, and you just push them forward towards the back of the drive, and then slide the disc tray out. It took me way too long to figure that out. And that belt is not quite perished, but it is out of round. And as luck would have it, none of my replacements are the correct size. So I'm gonna try boiling it and see if I can return it to its original shape. I've done that before with variable success, so I'm gonna give it a try. Okay, well, it's better. Let's get it back on there. Okay, that's a lot better. But I'm actually gonna take it back off because I'm gonna grease this entire mechanism. Okay, I was just fiddling around in here, and I noticed that the motor that actuates the laser lens carriage is awfully tight. It feels almost like that motor is seized. That might be that overheating smell I noticed. And by the way, if you're wondering why my voice changed, I seem to have acquired some human malware. But hey, I think it sounds cooler like this. Let me go ahead and pop that gear off. Now I'm gonna make a little mark on that motor shaft. That'll tell me whether or not this thing's actually rotating or not. And no it is not. That motor seized. Let's go ahead and drop that motor out of there. There probably isn't much hope for this motor. Let's try to unstick it anyway. Okay, it's getting there. However, just looking at those coils in there, looks like they're severely overheated. Well, let's give it some power and see if it works. And it does. It's definitely getting warm though. I'm gonna let it run and see if it overheats again. Okay, that thing's been running for a while. Seems to be doing just fine. I do wanna give it just a little bit of oil though. There's gotta be a reason why it was seized up. Let's just let that work in. And get rid of that excess. Well, it seems to be behaving itself now. There we go, much better. Now, let's see if we get any better behavior out of this thing. Now, 
Okay, well, it seems to spin up, but let's see if it ejects. It's still dropping the disc, but at least it opens now. I guess this just isn't a very high quality drive. Well, let's get it back in the system and see if it'll boot now. Okay, let's try this again. Sounding terrible, but it did spin up. And it wants to boot. Let's see how far we get. Oh, this. Just continue. Okay, that wasn't good. I can't believe it's still booting, though. That thing sounds as bad as my voice does right now. Oh, I think that was it. No, it's still going. That is the worst sounding CD drive I have ever heard. Okay, well, I don't think we're getting any further. It sounds like that spindle motor is also going bad. But that's about all the time I want to put into this drive. Okay, let's see if I can remedy this scuff. Just using Windex on a microfiber cloth. Okay, good enough, I guess. Well, that is one unlucky gold star. Although, those little 5 volt motors are pretty readily available. I could probably fix that thing, though I'm more tempted to try to find another drive that'll accept that faceplate. This one just seems awfully cheap inside. Something about that head transport mechanism just doesn't sit right with me. But hey, can't go wrong with the rest of the system though. This thing is for sure a survivor, ready to carry that unique countenance into the future and beyond. Let's move on to the next system. And here we have the Mini-Me clone baby of the first system. The resemblance is just uncanny. This case is just a little bit worse for the wear. A little bit disheveled. We also have some yellowing here. But we have a very nice color match CD and zip drive here. This one also has some nicely surviving badges. See we have a Celeron in there, designed for Windows 98. And here we are at the back. I see this machine also has onboard USB. We also have onboard video. Got a dial-up modem there with a built-in game port. That's interesting. We also have a NIC, broadband ready. And occupying a very strange space is the audio. Got line in, line out, and microphone inputs. That's quite an odd place for it. And here's a good look at that label. No data manufacture though. It's probably stamped on the inside. Speaking of which, let's get this thing open. Someone has clearly been inside this thing before. Hopefully that doesn't mean bad things. Let's get this thing apart. Wow, this thing is incredibly compact. And I see somebody took the hard drive out. Looks like they also took the hard drive caddy. So that's too bad. However, it looks like everything else is there. Now I see that audio panel actually runs down to the dial-up modem. So that modem must also be a sound card. I guess when you're under these kind of space constraints, you'll do anything to save a slot. And speaking of slots, I see we do have AGP. So that's very nice to have. We also have PCI and ISA, of course. And in this era, that's all you need. Let's go ahead and pull that dial-up modem out of there. Dial-up slash sound card slash whatever. And complete with a massive dust bunny. I see we have a Rockwell Riptide chipset. I'm guessing that's also who's providing the audio because I don't see any other common audio manufacturers on here. So that's interesting. I would have thought Creative War and Sonic would have gotten their grubby hands in here somewhere. It is what it is. Now let's check out that NIC. That's a bog standard 10100 NIC. HP original. Let's put that to the side. Now let's go ahead and get everything cleared out. Okay, it's time to get that power supply out of there. We got some kind of bracket contraption here, but it looks like it's just riveted in place. So let's just go ahead and remove the power supply screws and see how far that gets us. There we go. That wasn't so bad. Now I can finish getting that cable out. Well, having this silly bracket in your face while you're working isn't the most ideal thing in the world, but I've had worse. But that RAM looks like a whole nightmare to get to, and that drive cage is not removable, unless you want to drill rivets out, which you definitely don't. So let's try to make these hand bones bend the wrong way. Okay, that wasn't so bad. And the first stick is 128 megs of PC100. Pretty clean. Let's check out the next one. And here we have a Micron PC100 stick of some capacity. They're not kind enough to tell us. But at least it's clean. Now let's check that Celeron. 
And that is some perished thermal paste that has turned to thermal glue, as happens from time to time. There we go. Yeah, that stuff's gone. Yeah, sure, it looks like a Celeron to me. Let's go ahead and sweep that dust off. We don't need it falling inside the zip socket. Now let's go ahead and pull that thing out of there. And as advertised, that's our Celeron. All the pins look good. And I'm probably the first person to ever take it out. Let's get it cleaned up. Well, that was a lot easier than I thought it was gonna be. Okay, let's see what that fan's sounding like. And it sounds terrible. Let's see if I can help that bearing. Let's go ahead and yank that label off in order to get out the bearing. And drip some oil down there. Now let's turn that on and let it work in. And it's already sounding a lot better. Now let's clean up that excess oil. And use some Kapton tape to seal it up. And that's going to take some trimming. Done and done. Now I'll sweep that heatsink out. Okay, there is no way that motherboard tray is not removable. It's just way too tight in there. And there's no other possible way I could see to get to these drive screws on this side. Yeah, that thing's got to come out. Yeah, that sure looks removable to me. We've got two screws at the side here and two at the back. Although one is missing. Let's get those out of there. Okay, now, let's see how this goes. And yeah, there we go. Well, how about that? That thing's removable. Sure, wish I would have known that before I pulled that double jointed move to get that RAM out. And what's interesting is this thing can actually be removed with all of the peripheral cards still in place. So you can just pull everything out in one go. Well, that's a neat party trick. Okay, let's get that CPU dressed. And just like the first system, the floppy drive is a pretty common model, a Mitsumi D359M3. So that's good to know in case it's no good. I'm going to give this thing the usual lovey love treatment. And the zip drive is made by, you guessed it, iOmega. Because who else? You really can't clean the heads in these. They're a bit too fragile for that. Fortunately, they're kind of sort of self-cleaning so you don't have to. However, I like to open up these drives and clean them out anyway, just to get rid of the dust. Especially around this seal here. But overall though, this drive is super clean. And that CD-ROM drive is made by TIAC, model CD532E. And this drive has a surprising amount of weight to it. Hopefully that means it's luckier than the unlucky Gold Star, manufactured June 1999. So this itty bitty power supply is actually a standard form factor known as SFX. I guess for a small form factor X. And luckily I have a spare one of these that was sent in by a viewer. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. So the show will still go on even if this thing is no good. So let's test this thing out. Power on. All right, not bad at all. Voltages are looking good. Let's give it five minutes. Okay, and that five minutes is up. Nothing wrong with that power supply. All right, the time of testing is upon us. Again with the DOS boot disk. Let's see what it does. And we are posting. And we are complaining. Oh, you know, I forgot to check the CMOS battery. This is why you don't work on computers under the influence of influenza. Let's just continue for now. And that floppy drive works. Happily booting. And the CD drive's detected. Let's see if it gives us any love. Well, it opens right up. Let's see. And it works just fine. And sounds exactly how it should. So a TAC is luckier than a gold star. Let's see, how about CDRs though? And those work too. Very good. Okay, how about the zip drive? Sounds pretty normal. And I've already got the driver loaded. And it got assigned C drive. And it works. Good old zip drives. Seems like all the ones that survived the click of death are really reliable. Well, let's try to boot Canopics, why not? Ooh, apparently that's not happening. 
A kernel panic is the Linux equivalent of a blue screen of death. And that is too weird. I thought for sure Canopix 3.8 would boot on this thing. Guess not. Well, this thing cleaned up fairly well, though this plastic just isn't in the best condition. But I don't know, I kind of like this little thing. I don't know, there's something about a removable motherboard tray that just gets me. Especially one that brings all the peripheral cards with it. Let's move on to the next system. Okay, now we're in the translucent age. We've got a Pavilion 8565C here. It's got a few interesting little features here. For example, this panel here is actually a door that covers another CD-ROM drive, as well as an additional five and a quarter inch drive bay, but it has a little pass-through for the button, so you don't have to open it in order to access your main drive. It does look kind of funny like that with that extra space up there. And the top of the case has this ultra convenient storage bay for CDs. You really can't beat that convenience. And down here we have a port cover concealing a 9-pin serial port and a USB port. Now this cover is kind of broken, so hopefully we can put it back into sorts. And I see we have an Intel Pentium 3, designed for Windows 98. I sure love me some surviving badges. You know, it's really hard to get a sense for how wide this thing is until you look at the back of it. I see this one has that weird audio card as well. And there's what looks like that same sound card slash dial-up modem. There must be similar shenanigans going on in here as a second system. Now we got some kind of video card there. Possibly AGP. And here's a good look at that label. Alright, let's open this thing up. And this is the third system in the row to have the hard drive removed. While I applaud the data security efforts, it is nice to be able to dig through some old software. But what are you gonna do? Let's clear all these cables out of here. Okay, let's get everything out of the way of this video card and check it out. Starting with this audio cable. And a video card is AGP, an NVIDIA Riva TNT2. This looks like HP OEM made by ASUS. Very nice. Now onto the sound card slash dial-up modem. And that's interesting, this one has Codexant chips. The other one had Rockwell chips, but it sure looks like the same exact board. And it looks like our auxiliary audio connector is missing there, or at least a plastic part of it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Somebody was a little impatient. Very interesting. Now onto the NIC. And that's the same exact NIC as the last system. HP OEM, of course. Okay, let's try to get this power supply out of our way. Oh, it's a slot 1 Pentium 3. Well, that's interesting. And even more interesting is that power supply is not connected to the ATX port. There is no way this is an AT motherboard. What's going on here? Okay, yeah, somebody just jammed the ATX power connector up in there. Rather carelessly. Well, let's check that CPU out. And there it is, with the Cooler Master cooler on it. Well, the fan sounds better than the last system. Let's get this thing apart. Yeah, I'd say that thermal compound is gone. Well, let's see how that fan sounds. Okay, it doesn't sound too terrible. Probably just needs a cleaning. Let's go ahead and get that off. There we go, all clean now. Let's get it back together. Okay, so a drive removal on these systems is kind of strange. This entire center section is supposed to come out, and all that transparent plastic on the drives come out as one unit. And that could prove to be quite nerve-wracking because this thing's already got some broken plastic pieces floating around in here. So let's see how this goes. So we have a release tab up here. You pull on that and then push the entire drive cage forward. Okay, apparently there was a lot more broken plastic than I realized. Yeah, this thing was being held together by hopes and dreams. Now with that drive cage out of the way, we can get a good shot of that motherboard. It's an Asus P28-VT. Looks like this board could have had onboard video and sound. But those, of course, are not populated. Interestingly enough, they tell you what these spots would have been populated with. See, there would have been a Riva TNT there, and sound would have been an Insonic ES1373. 
Now let's check out that Ram. And that stick is made by Hyundai. I love the way Korean companies just make everything. <laughs> so this is a stick of PC100 that does not identify its capacity. So it's anyone's guess. Put that to the side. And this time I'm not forgetting to replace the battery, which in case you're wondering is completely dead. And the floppy drive is made by Panasonic. I'm not even going to begin to try to pronounce that model number. But it is funny how sticky outy that eject button is. That thing has a lot of faceplate to reach through. Let's give it the usual cleanup. And here's the CD drive that was behind that door. Manufactured by LG. So we'll see if this one's lucky. Manufactured November 1999. And here's the CD burner. Topping out at 20x. Made by HP, though most likely subcontracted to somebody, though who is not exactly clear. Made in December 1999. Okay, moving on to the power supply. It is a bit of a weird one. It has standard ATX mounting holes, but it's like ultra compact in this dimension. I don't know if that's some kind of standard or not. All I know is I don't have anything to replace it with, so let's hope it's good. Time to find out. Here we go. And that's an immediate failure. Let's try that one more time. Yeah, it's acting like it's shorted. Oh gee, I wonder what's wrong. Wouldn't have anything to do with all that capacitor plague going on, would it? Yeah, this thing's completely plagued out. But at least that means we can recap it at least. But for right now, I'm gonna have to use a surrogate power supply. And things are not looking good for our faceplate. I searched this entire system and these are the only two plastic bits I can find. And they don't even fit together. So that faceplate may just have to be held on with pressure from the drive cage. I was at least able to straighten out this port cover though. That's doing what it's supposed to do. Now let's get that drive cage back in there. That is a cool feature though, I'll give them that. And actually, that holds onto the faceplate pretty well. Okay, let's test this thing out. Let's get some DOS in there. All right, we're posting. And we're mad about the CMOS battery. Who cares? And we are booting. And we've picked up both optical drives. And I'm kind of annoyed that my capture device is cutting off part of the screen there. These things are so hit or miss. All right, let's see if we've won the optical drive lottery this time. Oh, that sounds terrible. But hey, at least it opened. Okay, I'm gonna guess that was our drive. And yes it is, and it works. Alright, what about CDRs? And CDRs check out. Wow, that is absolutely abnormal luck. I usually have the worst trouble finding 90s CD drives that actually read CDRs. Even CD burners. Okay, how about that secondary drive? Well, it spins up, and it works too. I think we've broken the curse of the unlucky gold star. Okay, now, I wanna know if this machine can boot Canopix 3.8. Let's give that a try. Show alt delete. Okay, that's getting further than the Celeron. We've got 128 megs of RAM. And there's our sound card. It's funny, it actually still identifies as Rockwell. This is the best part about Canopic's boot process. Gives you all kinds of hardware info. And we are fully booted. Although, it didn't like something about that sound card. That might just be too weird for old Canopic's. I just love seeing KDE3 again. I love its weird bouncy icons. Now, one thing I am dying to see I want to know if that CD drive's disk tray has enough power to open this door. Let's go ahead and send it the eject command. <laughs> it does! I cannot believe it. I thought for sure that thing would get stuck. I guess HP considered that. Let's try that one more time. Just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Ah, it was a fluke. Maybe I just didn't have it closed all the way the first time. One more time. Yep. Ain't got it. 
<laughs> well, that's funny. All right, let's shut this thing down. Well, it's a little worse for the wear, but hey, it could be a lot worse. With the exception of the power supply, everything seems to be functional. And I guess that faceplate's structurally sound enough. This thing's definitely had a bit of a rough life. Let's move on to the next system. And here we have the Mini-Me clone baby of the last system. It seems to borrow some design elements from the second system, just with a little translucent flare. You have to admire the toughness of those badges. Those things look brand new. Up top we have some system info here, on a sadly deteriorated sticker. Year 2000 compliant. Ah, the peace of mind that brings. Yeah, it looks like this system has one of those removable motherboard dealies too. It also uses an SFX power supply. Yeah, the similarities to the second system definitely run deep. Although this one has onboard sound, so they've blanked off that space up there. In fact, this thing has onboard everything, including USB. Alright, let's get this thing open. Hey, finally, one with a hard drive. Now watch, it probably doesn't work. Trigem? What on earth is that? I've never heard of them. Though that drive looks suspiciously like a Samsung, so I'm guessing it's just a rebadge. It is 8.4 gigabytes, which matches the sticker on the top. So I guess it's original to the system. Let's pull it out of there. And there's a good look at it. Well, whoever manufactured it did so in September 1999. I don't know, this thing just screams Samsung. Aha! A clue! Yeah, definitely a Samsung drive. Alright, that mystery is solved. Let's get these cables cleared out. Okay, now that's interesting. There's no way to disconnect motherboard power without actually removing the motherboard tray. I don't think anybody's double-jointed enough to pull that off. Least of all me. Yeah, that's not happening. Well, we're gonna have to pull it, I guess. Let's get that CD-ROM drive disconnected at least. There we go. And I pulled it out with that dial-up modem in situ just to prove that I can. Let's check it out. And that's a very funky looking US Robotics, also branded 3Com. Seems to be original to the system. And this system is amazingly clean inside. Check out that lack of dust buildup. Let's go ahead and pull our Celeron out of there. And that's looking Celeron-y to me. Let's pull it out. And yep, it's a Celeron. All the pins look good. Good enough. Now let's check out that RAM. And we got a 64 meg stick of PC133 there. Single sided. Let's check out the next one. And that's a stick of PC100 of unknown capacity. Also single sided though with some interesting trace work. That's kind of funny looking. It is too bad this motherboard doesn't have AGP or ISA. I guess this was trending towards those cost cutting years. Because who upgrades their computer anyway? Let's get that very dead battery replaced. No matter how gracefully I try to do that, it always turns bad. Okay, there's not much to do on this cooler except clean it up and check its whirly sound. Let's go ahead and plug that in. Oh, that thing sounds terrible. Sounds like a typical cheap bearing. Okay, I guess we're going to give it some oil then. Yeah, and this one I'm cutting in. This label seems hard to remove. And that is doing it. Now let's get that tired old thermal pad off there. That's better. And the floppy drive is a common Mitsumi D359M3. It has that same Pinocchio style eject button as the last system. Let's give it the love. Yeah, this system is so remarkably clean. I love it. And the CD drive's made by Samsung, just like the secret Samsung hard drive, manufactured September 1999. Okay, let's see what that little power supply has for us. Power on. Yeah, it does just fine. 
All right, well, it's made it past the five minute mark. I guess I trust it. Okay, let's do the test thing. And we're posting. And the hard drive sounds okay. Beep, beep. Hey, that hard drive's identifier string even shows up as Samsung. I wonder what the tri gem is all about. Why was Samsung hiding their Samsungness? All right, let's continue. Ooh, that's some kind of NT. Yeah, yep, Windows XP. Well, this thing is dragging slow. I think that hard drive is probably not very healthy. Let's see if we even make it through this boot process. I don't think I've ever seen that little indicator go so slowly. Finally, after about 20 minutes, let's see how long logging in takes. Okay, this slowness is not the fault of the hard drive. That thing sounds fine. Something else is going on here. Okay, this is taking way too long. It's time to do some troubleshooting. Okay, to me, this type of issue can only be explained by memory weirdness. So I'm gonna replace the mismatched pair that was in there with this single 256 meg PC100 stick, and we'll see how that goes. Once again. Okay, that's looking way more normal now. And we actually made it to the login screen. Let's see if we can actually log in. Sounds like it. Yep, we are in. Sounds like it's loading a healthy amount of crap. It's got Quicken 2004 on here. This thing might have had a fairly long life. Let's see what else we have on here. We got lots of Norton stuff. But there really isn't a whole lot on here at all. Let's see, what is this Parsons technology? Family lawyer. <laughs> yeah, we're not getting into that. Let's see, probably just have the default Windows games. Yep, sure do. Let's see if that version of Office is registered. Eh, it kinda is. Registered to desktop support. And I missed the version. Let's see. Word 2002. Seems legit. Let's see. Are we loaded with documents? Surprisingly not. Only a couple on here. Let's see what the space situation on that drive is, since this thing's so barren. Yeah, only about 50% used. This thing just had a boring little life. Let's see if that floppy drive's any good. Well, that's not good. Doesn't like the format. Sounds like that head's not moving correctly. No, you're not formatting my disk. I know it's fine. What is Norton complaining about? My antivirus has expired? No way! What are we gonna do? Go away. Let me get a disk in there that I don't actually use. Just a random one. And then we'll try to format it. Oh, okay, that one works. Alright, well that answers that question. Wonder why it doesn't like my boot disk. Maybe it's time for a new boot disk. Okay, now it's the CD-ROM's turn. And sounds like it works. And yes it does, and we get a nice little complaint there. This version of AOL is too old for XP. <laughs> okay. Alright, that drive's noisy. Let's get that disc out of there. Yeah, so far everything's checking out. Now, let's try to figure out when the last time this thing was used. And I always forget that we're in NT. We can just look at the event log. Let's make that big. System. Okay, I kind of refuse to believe that this thing was being used up to 2022. Now, I set the date to 2023. Oh, apparently it rolled back. <laughs> Why on earth did it do that? I guess this thing just couldn't believe it was 2023. Okay, well, let's just scroll past this erroneous date. And it looks like we have a winner. 2009. Wow, this has had a really long life. About 10 years. Okay, let's go ahead and run a check on this hard drive, since I may have falsely accused it earlier. Let's do it all. And of course, we're going to have to reboot. Yep. Do it. And what do you know? That hard drive is healthy. Okay, let's go ahead and start case cleanup. 
I'm going to try to preserve as much of this label as possible, though I'm not optimistic about that. I really would love to try to reprint it, but I can't find a high enough resolution image of it. Oh well, maybe I'll come across one eventually. This stuff looks tough, so I'm going straight to the magic eraser. You do have to be careful with these because they can remove the texture. Just try not to apply too much pressure. Make sure you're using a good solvent. Windex and IPA are a good choice. Yeah, those were some tough scuffs, but at least they cleaned off. I'm just going to leave the remnants of that label in place. I just can't bring myself to be the one to tear it off completely. And finally, we found a survivor. I was beginning to lose hope for these four systems. And this one doesn't even have any plastic damage, at least not that I can see. And that functional original hard drive is just a cherry on top. These are definitely the type of systems that nobody thought would ever be interesting again. And as such, I'm sure a great many of them didn't make it past their junk phase. This one is very lucky to have made it to an era where it can be cool again. Well, it appears I've survived my human malware incursion. It sure did wreck my upload schedule though. But now I feel like I can finally step out of my bubble and get back at it. My sincerest thanks goes out to all the supporters of the channel, especially the fine folks on Patreon. Your support helps tremendously, especially when I can't upload. Alright, it's time to go get myself back together. Thanks for watching.